be looking for information. Is there any quick question for Cedric? I can take one or two very quick questions for Cedric. Otherwise, we can have a conversation with Cedric. Yeah. Um, so two things. Um, Kinect as a device, yes, exists. There is a Kinect for Windows uh, available for developers. Um, we've seen some adop adoption of that on Front of Cell, for instance. Uh, if you go in Lego stores, uh, they've got Kinect dress up uh, devices where you can bring your uh, a little box of Lego, put it in front of the um, of the device sensor. And it will create a three-dimensional replica of the toy that you've got inside and that is animated. So the kids can actually see what they are going to build in virtual reality. Um, but beyond the, the actual device, the technology behind that is becoming more and more ubiquitous. Um, so voice recognition is now integrated in the set. So uh, Cortana lives on your, on your desktop and you can at any point of time say, hey Cortana, can you find it for me? The voice recognition is activated by the prompt Hey Cortana. Trigger to query, you haven't stopped doing whatever you were doing. It starts in the background. The next one also, uh, I was mentioning face recognition. Uh, Microsoft in Windows 10 will be launching something called uh, Microsoft Hello, which will be um, a face recognition and, and a biometric recognition of yourself as a way to authenticate yourself when you log your PC. But all that technology is purpose, so it was created for as a gaming interface and is now becoming the new way to engage with PC hardware, internet hardware. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Cedric. Uh, I'm going to do the next presentation, which is primarily uh, an introduction, really. Uh, and it's an opportunity to introduce some of my colleagues who are going to talk about smart tourism in the future. Uh, the, and it's also about trying to define a little bit what smart tourism means. Because if I ask you, everybody will have a different opinion of what smart tourism means. Uh, I'd like to play this video so you understand what's happening. We've got very new realities that are emerging into it, and we need new strategies. Uh, the whole range of different activities. 
So people are already engaged with a range of applications that are available uh, everywhere. And what they're doing is they, are, they require destinations and terms of organizations to be able to interact with them on whatever platform they are and operate with them. That creates a whole range of uh, interoperability issues and interconnectivity issues where you've got all these devices interconnected and led by the three main uh, controls. Here you've got a mo mobile phone, you've got a, a PC, and you've got a tablet or, or um, a, a, a laptop. What's going to happen is what we call customer centricity. Customer right in the middle. You've got a range of a range of hardware that's all interconnected from your car, from your computer, from your camera, all kind of uh, devices. You've got a range of networks. Then you've got a range of applications, and then you've got connectivity anywhere, any device, any time. What's going to that to mean is that all the all the um, uh, the different devices. They need to be interoperable and they need to be able to work together in real time and create real time content and connect with all the other organizations in real time. There are a lot of technologies that are coming up. This is from the Gartner Sky Cycle of Emerging Technologies Maps. And you can see a lot of different things that are coming out. And, and the key characteristics of all this is the interconnectivity of everything and the, the internet of things and how all those things will work together. With, with consumers. So one of the key issues is what is actually smartness? And I've been trying to define smartness in the last um, few months. Smartness takes advantage of interconnectivity and interoperability of integrated technologies to re-engineer processes and data in order to produce innovative services, products and procedures towards maximizing value for stakeholders. Yes, that's academics are doing so they're creating nice definitions. <laughs> well, I'm going to too. Uh, but it's really about interconnectivity and interoperability of, of systems. It's really about how you manage all these things together. This creates a re-engineering that enables saving products, actions, processes, and services in real time by engaging different stakeholders simultaneously to optimize the collective performance and competitiveness and generate agile solutions involved uh, in the value system. Smartness is a glue effect of all the systems, inter, inter, interoperably interconnected mutual beneficiary systems and stakeholders, and provide the infrastructure the value to create it all. So if there's one thing I'd like you to remember when you leave from here, is that smartness is the glue. It's the glue of systems that is used to create value for all. Now, I normally, if I've got a lot of time, I normally ask people, what do you think of the smartness? And it's amazing the range of, of, of answers I hear. But I think we are going to go to that kind of interconnectivity systems, interoperability towards creating value, and towards enabling people to do things. So smartness is about technology, human capital, social capital, innovation, governance, and Kim will be talking about that in a minute, in more detail. I guess I'm taking on your slides, Kim, so you may... Uh, so I'm not going to talk about that, but it's coming kind of from Smart City, and uh, it's about bringing smart living, smart mobility, smart people, smart economy, smart environment, and smart government. <coughs> and it's all about creating that interconnectivity and all value. Smartness became really important from, and started, um, uh, it started, uh, a lot of people started paying attention to smartness because of, because of big cities. Uh, by the 19th, the 19th century, uh, cities in the world with 20 million people in the 21st century. These are the big cities. And these cities will require a lot of technology, otherwise this will happen. If we don't have smartness, the whole thing is blocked. So we need smartness in order to be able to, to manage big data and to manage big populations and to manage big transactions and big, big operations. Uh, what you have in reality is you've got a range of different applications and different uh, functions like study, live, work, travel. You've got lots lot of different industries who are doing that. You've got lots of organizations who are providing these this functions. And then you've got data and information infrastructure that is supporting these processes. 
Uh, we're spending a lot of time actually defining that and, and Kim is working with uh, World of Tourism and the uh, National Academy, National Coastal Tourism Academy uh, to work on these things and develop those things in a, in a nice uh, proper framework. Uh, but this is exactly what's happening. So what you've got is you've got a lot of functions here on these three with smart homes, smart family service, smart emerging uh, industry, uh, sharing services and all the rest of it. And you've got a lot of technologies down here that they're supporting us. So here's the Internet of Things, smart treatment, smart grid, smart energy, smart transportation, smart work systems, smart communication, smart gener uh, generation uh, technology networks, uh, high-end software, and cloud computing that enables that to happen. So when we are looking to smart cities, it's all about aggregating and gathering data, discovering and analyzing information, and it's all about planning and executing optimal response. One of the key, key elements here is big data, because there's a lot of data that's being generated, especially when there's so many people uh, uh, are there. 9% uh, of the world data has been created in the last few years. It's a lot of data that's created every minute. How many people have taken pictures in here? How many people have tweeted them already? How many people said, well, it's the best thing since sliced bread? Okay. That was a joke. Okay. Um, when you are thinking smartly, it's all about interconnecting a lot of sensors and creating a lot of information. So in the big city, there are a lot of sensors that are creating a lot of information. It can be about weather, it can be about traffic, it can be about speed, it can be about, um, uh, it can, it can be about parking spaces. And all those things are, are, are sending information up on the cloud. This information is being processed and then comes down as what we, we call with team value rain. So it goes up. It's being processed in the cloud and then comes down as value, value pay. From smart cities, we're going to smart tourists. Based on smart cities research and methodologies, smart tourist destinations successfully implement smartness of destination to enhance tourism value. Smartness is fostered by open innovation, supported by investing in human and social capital, and sustained by participatory governments in order to develop the collective competitiveness of tourism destinations to enhance social, economic, environmental prosperity for all stakeholders and create value for business. This is what we're doing in Rome, We may not call that that, but that's what we're doing. Interoperability and ubiquitous computing assume that everybody is interconnected and process are integrated to generate value through dynamic co-creation, sustainable resources, dynamic personalization, and adaptation context. Uh, there is something that we call social marketing here. Social media complex based mobile marketing. We have written a, a very nice paper recently uh, with Marie about how do you provide the right kind of service at the right time of uh, at the right time to the right kind of customers. And this is becoming much more important in the future because what's going to happen is that in the past marketing was, was based on segmentation and was creating some generic products. Increasingly, it's going to bring the right product, the right customer at the right time at this particular moment. And that is a, a, a very different way of, of looking at it. All suppliers and intermediaries, the public sector, as well as consumers and various interested parties are networked, dynamically co-producing value for everybody interconnected in the ecosystem. And this is something that we're developing here. We're trying to understand what is the ecosystem and how the ecosystem of tourism works and how technology is going to bring off all these elements together in order to maximize the value that's being co-created in, in the marketplace. So this is some of the slides that Kim is probably going to go through, where here on the one side you've got the tourist destination, on the other side you've got the tourist, and here you're creating value, and I'm not going to do that because she's going to cover that. And then some of these things are coming out to uh, personalized experience, where on the one side, you have got a um, uh, tourism company that's creating um, tourism value through um, smart mobile uh, technology platforms, and they're coming here and create real-time personalized experience. This is a work that is based on Barbara's PhD, and Barbara is going to be explaining that that's a reference on one of the recent publications that we've done, so you can see a little bit of the details of this. Um, 
And again, um, that's Barbara, are you going to speak about that? No, you can't. Yeah? Okay. So it's, it's really about how you use technology to co create tourism products and services, and how some of the technologies will, will empower new experiences, and they're going to take uh, the travel experience to a new level, where some other, some other experience will, will remain conventional. Um, as far as social media is concerned, because a lot of the big data is based on social media, we really need to listen live to what's happening in the marketplace, and we need to understand what is the conversation that is happening on different social media. Collect this information, process and analyze it in real time and dynamically create solutions that will fix the, uh, the value and then provide value for consumers in real time. This, is, this has never happened before. Increasingly what we find is that people are not, um, they're giving their opinions live in real time. What we find is that people do not wait until they go back home until they complain. People do not go to the advisor and write a complaint or a compliment, but they tell you while they are there. This is, this is for the first time I've been in this business for 25 years. I've never seen anything like that happening. What we see now is on the social media, on either um, the uh, social media that belong to hotels or tourism organizations, or the social media that the tourists are putting together, they have got a live narration of their experience. This is a live narration, they explain, they take pictures, they say, look at this, this is a fantastic chocolate uh, fondue. Or they take these pictures and say, look at this glass, it's been there for three days, not really reconnected. I've never seen anything like that, and, and this is now a trend, it's going to go there. People will be uh, narrating live. So as a tourist organization, as a tourist destination, you don't have to wait until people are going back and write a report on TripAdvisor or whatever review they do in booking and go back and, 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 and reply to them. That's too late. It becomes such a, such a, 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 a neural system where we identify what's happening now and we take action now. So it's so dynamic. It's happening right now. It's happening in the context. And smartness would be about how do we do the interoperability of the systems and how do we understand the sentiment of the comment, wherever the comment is made, in order to be able to address it here and there. I think that's giving you an overview. Uh, some of the publications that they've come out in the last year that you may like to see what's happening, uh, and this is where you, you're going to find us. So, any questions? Perhaps we can take questions at the end when uh, one of my colleagues uh, have done uh, their presentation so we can see um, what, what we're doing. Janet, uh, Professor Janet Dickinson is my colleague who is looking at the Internet of Things and she is going to explore with you some of uh, the applications and some of the research that she is doing um, um, how people are using uh, mobile devices and how they are interconnecting everything. Um, this is a thing that is connected to the internet 
and it enables you to switch on the mechanism with your smartphone. Now, I'm not actually sure quite how many people really want to be able to do this, but you can. The Internet of Things, as I see it, is much more than this. It's not just about remote controlling devices from your smartphone, but, but clearly that's something that you can do through the Internet of Things. So, this is um, Innovate UK, uh, Internet of Things definition. There's, um, the key things in there are this idea that you have internet-enabled devices that can um, uh, collect information about either themselves or the environment around them. They can communicate that with other objects um, and potentially sort of generate new knowledge. So really what we see is um, objects can say something about their state, and they can say whether they're on or off. They can potentially collate information about the environment, things going on around them. They can share this information with other objects or potentially with us, with people. And objects can begin to make sense of this information. So they can learn from things around them, they can learn from what other objects are telling them about things around them, things that are going on, and generate new knowledge. Um, so the way I like to, to see this, or to think about this, is if you imagine objects gossiping. Okay, as an example here. So there's all sorts of different objects that could be connected to the internet and they could pick up all sorts of information. Here the examples are, are objects talking about their use patterns. If we just subvert this slightly, think about what if they were gossiping about you. So I put this into the context of these objects in my home, actually picking up information about me. Now, we don't like people gossiping about us, so how does it feel suddenly we've got a whole load of objects gossiping about us? It's actually sort of changed it slightly. So you can see why some people might be quite concerned about the Internet of Things. And to put this into a tourism context, if you imagine um, an Internet of Things enabled hotel, where you might have um, the ambient environment controlled by room sensors. Now these room sensors might be able to pick up things like whether there's people in the room. They might know how many people are in the room. These sensors could potentially communicate with various other uh, objects around the hotel. So maybe it's a hotel registration desk, and that registration desk tells them who is in that room or who should be in that room. And suddenly you have a whole lot of information being compiled about people by objects um, in the background, which could be highly personal, that is who you are, where you are, maybe who you're with, um, you know, how long you've been in there, all sorts of things we may not necessarily want uh, circulating. So um, there are interesting questions underlying the Internet of Things. Um, so the way I try to, or the thing that sort of interests me, we've been very used to a people-to-people internet. And from my point of view as a social scientist, I've not really been that aware of the Internet of Things so far. But the Internet of Things has been really gathering momentum in other fields. So, for instance, in fields like engineering, where there are now lots of connected devices provide, fulfilling all sorts of functions for us, you know, in terms of things like understanding flood prediction and such like. Um, but where we're now moving to, where I'm quite interested in as a social scientist, it's actually these coming together much more. So where uh, people and things are interacting in various ways. Um, and there's all sorts of interesting opportunities there, but also potentially various issues as, as well. Um, look at the main application areas. You can't see tourism in there at the moment, but if you just stop and think about some of these application areas for a moment, you can probably see that almost all of these are pretty relevant to the tourism context. So, for instance, something like environmental monitoring and clearly having real-time weather information could be very critical to organisations in the tourism field. Or transportation, and in terms of understanding congestion and routing tourists at appropriate times and, and ways to avoid that. You know, would be very relevant, but almost everything up there you can see would have some relevance in the tourism field. And there's also um, agricultural applications are pretty significant as well. 
And there is an internet sheet. In fact, there are quite several internet sheets, as far as I'm aware, fulfilling various different purposes within the agricultural field. Uh, the example here I give, from a tourism point of view, is that um, the internet sheet has potential relevance for the hospitality sector, food supply chain, and actually understanding things like food provenance. So um, there are um, systems out there where you can find out not just where your um, whether your land came from New Zealand or Wales, as is usually typically marked on the pack, but maybe which farm it came from or which sheep it came from, and also a whole um, catalogue of other information that can be picked up en route from you know the production on a farm to your plate. And so various interesting things from the point of view of sustainable food supply um, and feeding to the hospitality sector. Um, got some examples now from a project that I've been involved in, uh, which finished about a, a year ago. This wasn't, um, wasn't an Internet of Things project, but some of the things we did sort of were at the fringes of the Internet of Things. And um, we played around with a, a few issues in, in the Internet of Things in this area. So what we were trying to do, we were, we were, we were playing with the idea of whether uh, we could uh, facilitate more collaborative travel in a tourism context, um, you know, initially focusing on the use of smartphones. Um, one of the things that we did was we, um, we tracked people, um, very easy to do with, your, with the smartphone technology, but what we did was many devices or many systems will collect location-based information from people. But one of the things we did was we relayed this back to people in a normalised format so that people could actually see the movement patterns of people within their social networks. And they could, there's a time slide on the bottom of that um, screen animation there. People could slide this back and forth across time. And then kind of begin to get a picture of where people have been or where people might go in the future based on the sort of past patterns. And therefore, they can understand maybe opportunities for collaborative travel. You'll probably pick up from the diagram there that we, um, we base it around looking at campsites and possibilities of collaborative travel at campsites. So people might see opportunities for this share, or they might see opportunities such as they need to go to the shop, but actually there's someone already in the nearby town could actually pick up that shopping board. So these are the sorts of things that, um, that we were exploring. Now within the project, one thing that emerged from these ideas of, of trying to collaborate was people's concern about asking for help, and specifically people's feelings about being potentially exploited by other users, but also people's feelings of um, potential indebtedness if they ask people for help. And so, in a little bit of our later work, one of the things that we began to think about was how we can overcome issues about people asking for help when they want to sort of share um, resources in some way. And we subverted sort of this, and instead of actually getting people to ask for help, we got objects to ask for help. Now, in the Internet of Things, um, objects which are, are very sort of aware of their surroundings, aware of the way they're going to be used, potentially will have a lot of knowledge that they can pass out to you know, people, for instance, about where they need to be. So we took this idea and imagined, in the example here, that this beach ball knew it needed to be somewhere else where it was going to be used. And so instead of someone saying, I need a beach ball, can you get it for me? The beach ball asked for help. And we did this as a series of workshops in different contexts. This is in South Kensington, in London. We got people to imagine they were tourists on a day out. And um, they got given various tasks by these objects. Um, in the other example, we've got the desert or something. Around. So basically, these objects have to help and use the legs of people to move them around the place. So there's interesting things in terms of how the Internet of Things can actually anticipate things. It might anticipate people's need for objects, and actually they might take away the need for people to even ask for something, because it's, it's all about. I think that's sort of come through in the talks we've had so far. So just to, to wrap up really, I've, I've put together um, a list of questions which I haven't got answers for. But these are things really that come to my mind through some of the work that I've done um, and they're questions that sort of are quite prevalent 
some of them in, in the news, really. So, you know, first of all, will it make our lives any better? Well, it's, it's very difficult to, to answer a question like that. Um, next one, top-down exploration of transport and revolution. I just went through my wallet, pulled out a whole load of um, cars, which at various points in their usage collate a lot of information about me. Um, and, and one example, you know, which you're probably pretty familiar with is Matt Tesco's club card, saw club cards. Um, and these are an example of what I'd call pseudo sharing, where they actually pull out lots of information about me in return for relatively little. Um, and so there's an interesting issue about whether the Internet of Things will lead to more potential exploitation by large organisations who have the technology, um, can deal with things like big data, or whether actually there's an opportunity so I said that, for a more bottom-up revolution. Now, interestingly, in the tourism sector, you've got a lot of SMEs, these organisations would be quite agile, might be able to respond much more quickly to things that are emerging from the Internet of Things, and there may be a large organisation where it's going to come to the of change. So there could be an opportunity there. There's all the trust privacy safety, these security issues, which regularly pop up in the news. And, you know, we have trust issues in terms of do we trust other people on the internet, and what they're saying. And now we have trust in what something might tell telling us. Um, and there's also trust in whole systems and the way systems may be compiling data. Um, inequity issues in the digital divide. Now, interestingly, the Internet of Things um, could make that worse, but also the Internet of Things may be able to bridge some of these issues, because actually, potentially, people might benefit from the Internet of Things without actually having to interact with it themselves. So there could be an opportunity there. Um, there's only things to do with standards, interoperability, um, and making sure that as more devices become connected to the internet, that they can interact properly. And the skills issue, so thinking about it in the tourism industry, um, that, that's an area where you know, we really need to be, be kind of thinking about this now. And things like the e-tourism lab, you know, this is an area where we're actually beginning to build on these skills and develop skills to go out to the tourism field in the future. Okay, thank you very much for your time. Are there any questions for Janet? Any questions on the Internet of Things? Yeah, the, um, Would you like to say who you are, where you're coming from, and what perfume you wear? Um, yeah, <laughs> I'm Adam from Future Wi-Fi, and my app is this Pull in the Bear. Um, the campsite map, the heat map we did, was that um, people you knew, or was that randoms that you gave an app to? Uh, that was um, people who were previous part of the circuit. They didn't know they were being tracked. Sure. Yeah, yeah I, mean, I, was, I was intrigued by it, because obviously if there's a million apps out there, and I know in order to track people like this, you need your app on their device, and it's, uh, that's the, the gap at the moment, I think, that needs to be filled in order to make these things really happen. I think Antonio will be talking about how Telefonica is following uh, people on the mobiles. Uh, I'll talk a bit about that as well. Yeah, yeah. It'll be very, very interesting. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, John. Okay, okay. our next speaker is Kim Rose. Kim is uh, doing the PhD class and she is sponsored by the university and also going to it. And she is developing some of the cutting edge uh, uh, smart tourism um, theories and applications. So, if there would be a recipe for becoming a smart tourism destination, you can say that there are many different ways we can cook it. But there are certain ingredients that we do need. And I'll talk a little bit about these ingredients. Um, we heard about the technology side a little bit before. I won't go into that too much because probably other people will talk about it. Um, but there are certain things, and especially ICT, that we need, we need people and leadership. Because people are basically at the core of everything. So we talk a lot about technology, we talk a lot about the infrastructure, we talk about the Internet of Things and all the data and all these things, but what are we going to do with them if we don't have people? 
and if we don't have smart people and intelligent people, because we are talking about a smart tourism destination in the sense of intelligence. So we do need people in this. And one person on his own won't do the trick. We need more people. We need a whole network of people. We need an ecosystem of people. We need people collaborating with each other, cooperating with each other. And then we're not talking only about big corporations. We're not talking about only the government or the university. We're talking about you and me. Because now, with technology, we can. And we can do this because everybody has a smartphone. And everybody has a computer, or most of people have a computer. And this data is often open data. So everybody can have it, and everybody can use it, and they can collaborate, and they can make smart ideas and smart innovations. Which is the next thing. Innovations within this is an outcome of it. We want to have innovations in different parts in different fields, and there's one framework um, which I use, it's of Boy Cohen, he um, developed it in 2011, and he said, well, if you want to be a smart city, you have to have innovations in these six areas. And these six areas are not so much different from tourism, because basically tourism, tourism is building on this, it's using all of these six things. So these people, they get information and they get data, and they sit together, and they collaborate with each other, and they can create smart innovations. And smart innovations in these six things. So when we look at how we can do this, because of course innovation doesn't come from itself, and there are many tools of doing this, so I picked three, um, three examples. I have a look at Amsterdam, because I'm, I'm Dutch, and um, I like Amsterdam. And I think that Amsterdam is doing quite some cool things uh, to being a smart city. And also because of its culture, so in the Netherlands we're very open, and we start from more of a bottom-up approach. And if you look at Amsterdam, is what you see is that they have been the first digital city back in the 90s already. And that all those things didn't really work out, and now they become a smart city in 2009. And they've been doing quite a lot of things. And one of these things is the iBeacon. And um, the iBeacon is quite an interesting thing. And they've been placing this around their city in a certain route in the middle of Amsterdam. And you can use it um, for testing different things. And they tested this also for tourism. And what they did is that they have all these high beacons around the city. And what they tried is that if you are a tourist and you're traveling to Amsterdam, then it would be nice if you have the information that you're looking for in your own language. Without searching for it in your own language, this ID will send you the information in your language without any further things from your side that need to be done. So Amsterdam is, is creating something nice where they can test things, but also for tourism. Um, they're doing quite a lot of other things, and I put some links in the end if you would be interested in this. Um, another thing is a hackathon. Who of you have heard of a hackathon before? Some of you. So a hackathon is basically a company or a place opening up data and making it available uh, to people that they can compete basically on who has created the nicest idea in the end and they can earn money with this. So in this in, in, in London, um, it was um, a couple of two months ago I think, it was in June. And what Saber and Sabra did is that they opened up data about traveling and they set some smart people together and they worked on creating apps for tourism and for traveling. And people could earn, as you can see, 10,000 pounds with this if they would win. And London is not the only one doing this, Amsterdam is doing this and Helsinki has been doing this quite a lot in the past. And what it does, it brings a lot of people together. They have a certain amount of time to come up with creative ideas and make new business ideas. So this creates a lot of things in a very short and very fast time span. And um, for companies, it's of course nice because this is most of the time done for free. Uh, but for these people, it's also cool because they can actually win something. So it's good for both sides. So hackathons are one of the things that you can use or at one of the tool to create innovations. Something else which I like a lot is, um, is Vienna and their development of Aspen City Shop. I don't know if anybody of you heard of it. No? 
So what Vienna is doing, um, they were very fast in this whole smart city thing. And um, what they decided to do is build a living lab or part of the smart city from scratch. So there was nothing, it was an open area, there were no buildings, there was absolutely nothing. And they started building in 2010, and they are aiming on housing 20,000 people there in the couple, next couple of years. They use technology everywhere, they use smart grids everywhere, they are very much on sustainability and uh, zero energy housing, and they include their community everywhere. So they have a smart slam where they can create smart ideas, they bring people together, they collaborate with them, and this is not only with technology all the time. So they use technology if it needs to be, but what they are very good at is in creating a community, making everybody feel like they are part of this community. So people are very happy to work together, <laughs> people are very happy to enhance and, and make the quality of their environment better. So they're using the collective intelligence of everybody, everybody in there. Every single person in this place living there is working on this. And what Vienna is doing something as well is that a couple of weeks ago I read about this that Vienna is becoming the next Silicon Valley. And I didn't know that, and I didn't expect that either. Um, but they are creating a very nice environment for technology companies to come to. And also because of this, there's a lot of knowledge there in technologies, and they are also working together with us from Zetra to create new ideas and new innovations. So again, technology is enhancing these people, bringing them together, giving them information, making places where they can collaborate and where they can create innovations. So in the end, we also need, of course, a little bit of leadership. We've been talking with Antonio this morning about who is now doing this. Because if I look at Amsterdam, I very much see a bottom-up approach. It's very much from the community that the ideas come and the government is providing them with the means of doing this. But if I then I look at Barcelona, for example, it's very much a top-down approach. So they are very much pushing technologies, they're very much giving technologies out and making sure that people are being informed about it. There is no way of doing it a better way. In my opinion, Amsterdam is working in that way because we have a culture that works that way. But maybe Barcelona is in a different culture, so that's why maybe for those countries it works better from the top down. That's why I said these are ingredients, this is not a certain recipe for it. But leadership is very important, and if you look at Amsterdam, what I find a very good example is the start of visa. They made it possible, um, the, the government uh, or came up with a new regulation of visas, and now entrepreneurs can get an entrepreneur visa for four people and they can come to the Netherlands and work there for one year and they have certain tax regulations and all these things that are easier for them only because of this visa that came out in May. So they create, they're getting these people here, they're getting people to their city to create things with them. And that's why they are increasing their competitiveness because they are hope, they're getting the Italian people to their destination. The more intelligent people, the better you will have your collective intelligence and the better your innovations will be. So this is something that we have to keep track of. So in the end, what I'm saying is that smart tourism is more about than just technology. Technology is good and it's a unique connection that we have now between people and technology that is changing the way we've been doing things. It's not the same as we had. People can have information every time, every <coughs> single second of the day. Things can go in real time, as we've heard before. And this is changing now, so we have to make usage of that. Because if we have more data, and if we have more people, and we have more smart people, we can create better solutions, and we can be more competitive, and we can have better tourism destinations. And not only this, but we can also, at the same time, increase the quality of life for residents. Because we're all living in the same place and we have to make sure that residents and tourists get together and that it's a good place for both to go to. So that was my presentation, thank you. Thank you, Kim. Obviously, Kim uh, provided some examples from Amsterdam and some other places on how smart cities work. Any questions to him? Any questions to him?
No? Okay. We we we'll, we'll do the panel again. Yeah, thank, thank you very much. Uh, our next speaker is my colleague uh, Nigel Williams, uh, who is uh, doing a lot of research on uh, network analysis based on Twitter and how people are using Twitter specifically in big events. Nigel. Good afternoon. So our research is kind of similar to what you've seen before. We look at the core evolution of technology and human behavior. And you see bits of all the presentations that have gone before, looking at the internet of people and things and smart tools and, and so on. Um, this is a study that we did. Uh, it's part of a larger study we're doing on Bournemouth and Bournemouth Air Show. Um, this is just what happened in one year, essentially. And what we looked at is e-word of mouth, um, about a destination where a large event is being held. So why you would have this is a small tourism group, so you probably know what that is and why it's useful. So I won't spend too much time there. So especially in the context of festivals, they generate a word of mouth that could be used um, to help engage new tourists, potential tourists interested by standards. And we saw a couple of things about e-word of mouth that could be useful when looking at studying it. One is the overall pattern of distribution. Uh, that can influence how far you reach with your e-word of mouth. And the content of the discussion can help influence purchases. So, in our research, we modeled it as a community of interest. And in doing that, we can start applying network approaches and ideas mathematical techniques borrowed from social network analysis to see what is the overall structure of the discussions while the event is being held, network structure, as well as what the content of the discussions are. Now, social network analysis, instead of looking at associations between variables as you would in a quantitative study, you know, um, income and tendency to visit, or interesting involving processes, how the tourists choose to visit one location. Network analysis looks at um, interconnections between entities. So that could be between people, between cities, between devices. In this specific case, we look at information connections between people on Twitter. So you see two accounts, two entities, and there's some relationship that connects them. And by aggregating all of those relationships, you could model that as a network to determine who's important, who's not so important, and then we could look at the content of those discussions to see what's being said and make some inferences as to why it's being said. So why do we use Twitter? Much smaller than Facebook. However, if you look at the academic literature, Twitter is very, very popular. Reason being, it's um, the public by default, so it's kind of easy to get a lot of tweets to look at. And you can look at an entire network with Facebook since you're sort of limited by your friend circle or who's like your page or your community. You get more of an ego network. It's difficult to get a whole network without getting into a lot of trouble and possible legal implications. Twitter content in itself resembles how people interact in a public space. So the amount of personal information that's being shared, the type of things that have been discussed, information, opinion, rumors, and so on. Uh, how people interact in offline public spaces, far more than Facebook. And other platforms, as I said, the content's mostly private. And getting access to it requires, um, or could require, either the permission of the platform or illegal activities, which we don't engage in, because we have law-abiding academics. So, research questions, not so interesting. So the process, archive the tweets, remove the duplicates, we look at the interactions in the tweets. So this would be retweets, replies, mentions. We're looking at information interactions, not necessarily relationships. Did all network analysis, found out people. Then we looked at the content, to find out what the keywords were. And then we made some classification of the users and the, uh, within the groups according to the destination, Bournemouth and the event, Bournemouth the festival. And we made some discussions about that. So overall, 2013, 2014 results are quite similar. Um, 
2012, 2011 numbers were a bit lower than this, so 2013 represents it enough. Most of the content or tweets shared were from the destination. That's in red. The stuff in blue is what actually happened on the days of the event itself, how many tweets. So you can see that, of course, the destination generated far more interactions than the event itself, the issue when it was being staged in 2013. Got these social communities. Um, that doesn't mean very much because I could make that graph say anything. But trust me when I say that there were a lot of communities and largest community was 10% of total, which indicates that there was no large central authority when we look at the Bournemouth location. When we look at the event, we saw the opposite. We had a very large, important single community, lots of small ones, and a lower degree of interconnections across communities, which means that the stuff in the uh, event formed very distinct clusters that um, meant that if you were in one cluster, you wouldn't see the content from another. And those are the interests of the engaged stakeholders. We won't go through all of them, but essentially we compared both of them. Um, and what you find is that most of the air festival stuff occurred within the overall Bournemouth network in, um, in group one. And we got very good stuff. Characteristics of users for who a bit more time. On the location, we see quite a few clusters that are dominated by international users, not local users, which suggests that content shared there would have reached the international audience. For the event, we saw the opposite. We saw most of the content that was shared is mostly from local users, not necessarily international, which suggests that direct air-show-related air stuff would not necessarily reach an international audience and hence not promote the destination. However, when we looked at the content of the discussions, we found that um, when destination-related features were mentioned, so for example, the pier, they were mentioned in the context of the air show while the event was being held. So essentially what the content analysis is saying that the, um, the air show was successful in promoting the content and international audience, but not directly, indirectly, as was mentioned in that context. So, and here's where we spend a bit more time, because this stuff is not really that interesting. What we found overall is that social media-based e-word of mouth is quite similar to other forms of online discussions, structures, we're going to put in that structure. And if you look at research in politics and sociology, epidemiology, all of which have used Twitter's, Twitter, um, Facebook, network forms, and so on, um, you tend to find very distinct clusters in which content is shared. And you have, if you've ever heard the term, the filter bubble. No, nobody's ever heard that. So where you're only going to see content from one group and not from anybody else. Now, we're finding that in online, you would have more, do, these same patterns also exist. And that the key users were found to be people who already had a significant offline presence. So these are people who are already prominent, which is sort of the opposite of what you'd find, what you should find on an open platform like Twitter, simply because since it's easy to retweet and share anybody's content, why would you just choose to retweet the perspective shared by the official air show or by some celebrity? You know, you can share your own photo to your friends. But that wasn't quite what we saw happening online. And one of the reasons that we think that happened is because there was a pattern of emergent user curation. Now, in other platforms, like Facebook, for example, you've got your news feed, which is an algorithm that determines what you see. There's some program that says even if it's X and not Y. Um, in the Google Now things, if you've got an Android phone, you see content being surfaced as well. But that's also being shared by Cortana as well. There's an algorithm that says that you're going to see these things that you seem to be interested in and not necessarily everything that's available. Now, on Twitter, since we don't have many of these tools yet, some of these are emerging, um, the users of Twitter were performing that filtering themselves. They were doing their own curation by exhibiting particular patterns of sharing behavior. And these users, as a way of coping with Twitter, which can be quite a, a, comp a complicated stream, of content were picking what they were going to share and that formed their pattern of curation. So that's what they were able to see. 
Um, so yeah, we, I think we talked about it before. A little volume of tweets mentioned that. And takeaway from that is that events were an online animator of destinations, not just an offline animator. So in other words, events promote discussions about a destination, not just in the offline domain through PR and so on, or um, newspaper articles, but in the online domain as well. And we saw three characteristics that might have been kind of useful for comparing across various events and destinations, and we're applying this framework in our work. The first is the scope, where we looked at what's the overall focus. The um, destination had a relatively uh, an international focus, the festival had a local focus. But we saw mentions of the destination features, it was in the context of the event. And span the pattern of topic engagement. Most prominent users, people already had an offline presence, which meant the range of topics discussed would be relatively low. So, for example, you won't see too many negative things about the issue that were shared um, over a wide range of, of users. Those discussions, when they initiated, didn't go very far. So, it's the overall structure represented a company managed forum. So, if you were posting on uh, Microsoft's website with a moderator, uh, where the discussion is, so can be moderated, can be controlled, and offending content can be removed. And this happened on Twitter, which is supposed to be an open platform. So, short summary, 3S framework, we can use that to compare destination related community of interest, which is what we're doing in our current work. Uh, we would want to take a holistic view of engagement. We want to move away from attention related metrics to interest related metrics, because it's kind of easy to count the number of likes you get, so you're getting attention but how many people are actually sharing and engaging and where is your content going? That's, that's more of an interest-related metric, so I'm interested. And um, understanding network structures means that you can try to manage this behavior that's normally passed as a manager. So, short answer. Questions? How fast it is, and how live content you can get, and how you can do the analysis in real time, and how you can actually have reactive uh, uh, solutions and decision making. Especially in the festival um, on the air show in summertime, where there are a lot of things happening, there are a lot of external factors are influencing the situation, like weather, and um, so many people are co creating the event. Uh, and I think that's something that. Um, we need to work together, John, in terms of how we can do live analysis and support decision making live based on, on Twitter sentiment. Thank you very much, Major. Thank you. Okay, our next speaker is uh, my colleague Philip Alfo, who is looking at the entrepreneurial small and medium enterprises and how agility is uh, driving smarter and data driven marketing. Okay, thanks very much. Uh, I'm going to uh, shift the emphasis a little bit now away from maybe so much on the consumer use of technology to more on the actual business owner's use of technology. It probably won't surprise you to know that over 90% of tourism is actually delivered by micro enterprises. Um, that's across the EU and it's the same uh, here in the UK as well. So these, these these people matter uh, in terms of individually and collectively as a destination. There's some key words here you can see in the title of the presentation. I've kept it to about four or five slides because I'm very conscious that you know, 3.30 is looming up. Um, I'm sure uh, to would like to leave a few minutes for, for questions perhaps at, at the end. And actually also we've got our own session at 6 o'clock this evening, a little plug. Um, I am a marketing after all. Um, and so we're doing our own digital transformation workshop, uh, a very hands-on interactive workshop. Hopefully I can demonstrate some of the applications I'll refer to 
little bit later as well. So we're in the of the this evening. So I'm really keeping it quite, uh, quite sort of minimalist uh, for this particular presentation. But some key words there, entrepreneurship, marketing, and of course, uh, technology. So where really my work is taking me is the sort of intersection between uh, entrepreneurship, marketing, and digital technology, um, particularly looking at entrepreneurial marketing. We're very, very keen to demonstrate the real impact through this research. Um, I'm delighted to say that we've made some headway already. The initial study was funded by the Economic and Social Research Council, uh, which was a study of 60 uh, micro enterprises in Dorset and Hampshire. I'll talk a little bit about that in a couple of minutes. Uh, that's now uh, been picked up by one or two key sort of uh, gatekeeper organisations. We've been talking to the Federation of Small Businesses, uh, Visit England, who have an advice hub on their portal to support small businesses who are interested. And I've just joined the, um, the Euro European Commission's uh, Digital Tourism Series Group. So there's some quite exciting things happening in the small business and entrepreneurship field, which is, uh, I think, really, uh, really interesting. Uh, in terms of marketing, I mean, it's fair to say that there is a, there is a gulf uh, between, I think, what's been actually what's been taught, what's been published, and what actually needs to be needs to be practiced. Um, that's also recognised by the, um, the Marketing Science Institute that, uh, as you can see, uh, you know, are actually advocating that there needs to be quite a bit of a mind shift and a bit of a change. Um, I think we do need to be careful though before we jump on a digital bandwagon from a marketing perspective. I think marketing is still about that value exchange. It's still about adding value for customers and ultimately it's the customer who determines that value, and we mustn't, we mustn't forget that. We, we hear a lot about you know, digital marketing, internet marketing, and I'm a great advocate of that, but that's what it boils down to. For me, digital is the way to get there. Uh, but let's talk a little bit. Let me just uh, show you a poster that um, myself and Sally, who's sitting over here, Sally's working with me on the project as my research assistant have put together for our part of our presentation this evening, just to give a little bit of summary of uh, what we've been doing and who we've been doing it with and why it actually matters. So this is, uh, and I'm not expecting you to read all of that in the next 30 seconds, uh, let me assure you, but so let me just kind of pick out maybe one or two key bits. Um, I think it looks very pretty though, it's a nice looking, uh, nothing, looking slide and nothing else. So we started our, our kind of journey with digital destinations, which was our 60 largely small business enterprises based in this, uh, in this area, uh, essentially looking at what the opportunities and challenges are being faced by small business in that whole kind of digital space. Uh, we've just had the, the output of that published actually in the Service Industry Journal, which I'm delighted to say, just got out to, to publication in the last few weeks. So that's kind of capturing what we've learned from that. We've now taken that forward. We're working with individual businesses in a at, a, at a much deeper level. Um, which includes uh, some uh, mainly regional, local and regional businesses. So delighted to say that uh, Jackie Richmond from Splashdown is with us at the moment. So hello, Jackie. Um, Acorns is a bed and breakfast in New Forest. Surf Steps here in Bournemouth. Norburton Hall is a five-star self-catering business in the uh, near uh, in the Jurassic Coast. Hotel Terravina is a boutique hotel in New Forest. Uh, and Daisy Bank College, a boutique bed and breakfast in New Forest. So regional small businesses. And what we're doing is we're really going into, into some detail on these kind of areas around entrepreneurial marketing, and innovation, use of technology. We've tried to capture some of the impact that we've already had with these businesses through some of these quotes that you can see on the, uh, on the side here. Uh, we've also tried to, where possible, um, get some clarity around what we actually mean by things like entrepreneurial marketing, innovation and the like, because you know, in my experience these are slightly overused terms uh, with many, many different interpretations. So for instance, if we, if we look up here, um, uh, this paper by Gilmore, uh, defines entrepreneurial marketing as you know, being adaptive, um, building networks, we find that's incredibly important within this uh, SME space is the ability for them to, to cluster, to create innovative networks, and through that, um, uh, you know, interesting things begin to happen. Developing competence, and one of the 
huge barriers and one of the huge obstacles to uh, engagement with digital in this small business space is a lack of competency and a lack of skills and knowledge. Such a fast moving area, we've seen that already today. And you know, these are very often owner managed enterprises that simply don't have the time to, to kind of step out and, and actually get these skills. That's something we need to address. Innovation again, and this area, effectual again, I'm not say too much about it, but just got a quick slide on it after this one which is a little bit how entrepreneurs think and behave and develop. I, I'll, I'll, I'll just show you that in a, in a second. So you can kind of see what we're trying to do here. We're trying to kind of, as it were, get a synergy between these academic concepts and what it's really like on the ground to, to run, to manage, and try to grow a small business. Um, and this is the area of effectuation, which I've got into quite a bit recently. It's coming from a work by a US professor um, called Sarasvathy, who looked at, did an in-depth study of how entrepreneurs actually think and develop. And perhaps not that surprising, they don't really formally plan. Many of the small business literature you'll look at will confirm that small businesses don't do formal planning. They kind of work in a very sort of bottom-up approach. And I'm not going to take too long to give you a detailed uh, overview of it, but essentially what she says is that entrepreneurs start with the needs they have at their disposal. And they start, and that, from that, they determine their goals. They go out, they interact with stakeholders, they build stakeholders around them, they get commitments from those stakeholders, and then that generates new means and very often new goals. And the means is, for, is, is a collection of who the entrepreneur is, what they know, and who they know. And that's the key element. Um, which is the beginning of those of those means, and really, I think this is my penultimate slide. Um, what occurred to me when we were working through this whole digital area? One of the aspects we're looking at is the wealth of information and the wealth of data that exists out there that is incredibly useful for small businesses, and it's out there. Um, and we've heard about big data. I think again, that's another overhyped term, quite frankly. But for a small business. This is big data. If you show the average small business owner their Google Analytics account, what kind of thing? Well, you know, they'll, they'll struggle to get past the first uh, screen. And beyond that, they've really got relatively little idea about what the data actually tells them. Very few of them, if any, are actually measuring any of the conversions through Google Analytics, which is one of the key metrics within Google Analytics. Um, we should talk about thing as well, not just Google, my apologies to our uh, <laughs> representative from Microsoft, which is an equally good product, of course. <laughs> um, so there is, there's a wealth of data, but again, we're back to that lack of knowledge and competency to be able to work with this data. I've been talking to my master's students about this the last few couple of weeks. You know, TripAdvisor stats, online booking stats, you have to be very careful how you say this. Uh, Follower Wonk is uh, one of the applications from MozRank which actually allows you to analyze the followers you have on Twitter by their social authority and a whole bunch of other things, where they're located and really do a deep dive into your, into your kind of analytics data. MozRank is great, open site explorer for looking at who's linking to you and, and so on. And True Social Metrics, a great tool for analyzing your social media engagement. So, I'm going to demo some of these this evening, so I'll go into the detail. But essentially, the premise here is that if we look at what effectual logic talks about, you know, you start with your means, which includes what you know. The reality is that so many small businesses can know a lot more, which would really enable them to strengthen and, um, if you like, innovate uh, their marketing and be a lot more entrepreneurial. So, what we're doing at the moment with these six businesses and also reaching out a little bit further from the local area is looking at how we can build a digital snapshot of what a business what does that look like for a business and what does that tell them and how will that point them in new directions which will then of course open up avenues for content marketing and for for digital engagement so that's a whistle stop tour of what we're doing but again there's a full movie tonight at six o'clock so um thank you oops okay thank you very much. See, I could not get here, right? He's coming to your event and uh, he's promoting uh, <laughs> his. That's really fine. Wonderful. Wonderful. Okay, any questions for Philip? Maybe later. Okay. Um, last on my list is uh, 
Pārtādā no ir fēr, pārtādā ir svīgi par tā, cik arī sēdz un kokrīzi un vēl pirmītas. Un cīs gājīt tu lūkīt tu smārtūs un kokrīzi un vēl pirmītas. I'm Barbara Neuhofer, I'm a lecturer here at Bournemouth University, I'm also a member of the e-tourism lab. And what I'm going to present today is really the research that we've been doing uh, in the e-tourism uh, lab over the past three to four years. And it's really looking into my PhD that was about tourism experiences and uh, co-creation. And what I would like to do today is to link those concepts to smartness and uh, smart tourism. We have heard quite a lot about smartness today already, and everyone has kind of presented their aim to smartness and how you, each one of you, approach smartness, how you define smartness. But what I'm trying to do today is um, to ask the question of why. Why is smartness important? Why do we need it? So beyond understanding the what it is, I feel that it is particularly important that we really understand of why does smartness matter? Why do we bother creating smart technologies, smart destinations, smart cities? And I would like to approach this from a consumer perspective. So what is the ultimate value? What is the benefit for the consumer that we're trying to create here? And what are the possibilities of enhanced experiences for customers? And I would like to use this framework here um, which was obviously developed by my colleagues Kim and Demetrius. So they, they define smartness on the left-hand side. But what I'm trying to do is combine it somehow and interlink it with my research. And my research is really into said, tourism experiences, technology, but also co-creation of experiences and value. And my uh, aim is to interlink those concepts and really see if how can we enhance customer experience? How can we create better experiences by using smart technology and combining those concepts. So this is really uh, what I would like to take on a small journey over the next couple of minutes. Okay, so let's start uh, with the concept of cooperation. Who in this room is familiar with what cooperation is? Okay, so most of you uh, raise your hands, which means that you have heard about cooperation or you understand fully what it's about. Okay, for those who haven't heard about it much, I really try to squeeze it in the next couple of minutes. Normally I explain it in five hours, so I really do my best to, to explain it to you in an in a easy way. Okay, co-creation. Co-creation has started around uh, the turn of the century. Around 2000, 2004, we have seen the first uh, time that the concept of co-creation was coined. Um, why did co-creation emerge? It's not an entirely new concept, but it became really popular at the turn of the century. And one of the main um, reasons why it became so popular is because there was this empowerment of consumers. The consumer has become empowered. Consumers have become really connected to a range of technologies. Hand in hand with the connection of social media, the availability of social media, consumers have become much more connected, much more empowered, more educated, more informed. They now have used all the range of technologies, social media out there, to get connected. And they're not only consuming content, they're no longer reading websites like we did in Web uh, 1.0. They are producing, they are presuming in a sense, they are reviewing, they're writing, they're sharing, they're exchanging. The consumer is really part of this conversation. The consumer is much, much more active. And this has really led to this development of this empowered consumer who is um, participating in a whole range of platforms online. And what this has then led to is something that we call um, the prosumer. So the experience, uh, let's say consumer, is not only the consumer of an experience, but effectively the consumer has become a producer of the experience as well. So in a sense, this is quite the term prosumer, which we're all familiar with. And the prosumer was really this, one of the starting points of this whole paradigm shift that has happened. And how does this now relate to experiences? Well, 
We have experienced economy for quite a long time. Everyone is familiar with experienced economy and marketing. It's been a big buzzword that we've been dealing with over decades. But what has changed? Well, in the experienced economy, the principal idea was that, is that we are consuming or recreating experiences for consumers, but they are produced by companies. So it's a quite a traditional process, a one-way process, which means experiences are created by consumers for companies. But this is a one-directional way those experiences are created. But then when corporation arrives, it has really induced a paradigm shift. And we have moved from creating experiences for consumers to creating experiences with consumers. And this is the fundamental idea, in a nutshell, of what co-creation is about. And it's about this twofold relationship, this new change relationship where we enter with our customers in a dialogue. We empower them to be part of the conversation, to engage with us at all levels. And it's really about co-creating services and experiences with them. OK. And now let's take a bit of a turn to theory. So what is the underpinning uh, in terms of the academic literature? Um, the main theory that we're dealing with is something that we call service dominant logic. Service dominant logic, let's say, is the philosophy that is behind this whole co-creation principle. And service dominant, dominant logic um, effectively suggests that experiences cannot be simply packaged. Experiences cannot be packaged, they cannot be staged, but rather we need to let go of our control from a business point of view, and we really need to include our customers in the process and create experiences with them. And this is the fundamental idea. And customers can only create experiences when they're part of it. So it's about the in-use idea. For example, I say you can see a beautiful car, so let's take the example of a BMW. Per se, a car does not have any value. The car is just a car, but once you use it, you create your own experience. You apply your skills, your knowledge of how to drive a car, your experience, and you create it in use. And this is the fundamental idea. The producer of the car can only produce it, but only you are the one to then create the experience and extract the value of using it. Okay, and this is the fundamental way how we now look at how experiences are created. And if there is no consumer, there is no experience, and there is no value. But ultimately, this means the consumer is the one who determines value. It is you. You decide what is my value that I extract from this experience. Okay? So in a nutshell, this is what co-creation is about. And if we look at application, for example, form of tourism could, for example, provide a mobile application, and we successfully do. But the mobile application is only that. But then it's the customers themselves, the tourists, who use this application and they co-create, in a sense, with you their own experience. And they create value for themselves by using this application. So, let me ask this question. So if companies can no longer simply package experiences, you know, when we think about Disney and, and many decades ago where we tried to really package experience, so what can companies do nowadays? Well, there's three main things. First of all, companies can facilitate the environment, which means that if we're operating in this ecosystem, the so companies can really create a system where they provide the resources that are necessary for experiences to happen. So it's about the ecosystem. This might be on a macro micro level. It might be a destination such as formal, but it might also be a more micro setting like a hotel or a restaurant. So think about that on how we can simply facilitate environments. Then the other thing is, we can uh, use and provide resources for tourists to do so. So give them the things they need to create experiences. Those might, might be products, those might be services, but those might be platforms, applications, and so forth. And this is also where technology comes <coughs> in, because technology, we can understand, is a key catalyst of change. Uh, all the previous speakers have mentioned the critical role of technology. And I fully agree with that. Technology is a game changer, and technology can be used now as a key resource to make co-creation happen. And we can provide our tourists with, with applications, with platforms, <coughs> with uh, um, different um, sites that allow them to create better experiences. So let's take a bit of a closer look at technology. So how does this now all fit in? Well, 
We've heard before that we've got smart cities, we've got smart destinations, and we've got all this technology that is around us constantly, whether it's about transport, it's about interactive media, it's about city guides. So we have all this fantastic technology that's just kind of floating around us. So what are we doing? And I would like to contextualize it in tourism. And this is a model um, based on the, the previous interest showed on Telefonica, and we did it in my research, and it's something that we call the connected mobile tourist. And effectively, we can see the bubbles that are, are floating around the tourists. So in the middle, it's the tourist. It's the connected tourist with all these devices. So I, as a tourist, stay inside. Am I using my smartphone? Am I using the, my Google Glasses? Do I use my laptop? Or do I use um, some other new technologies that we can see over the next couple of years? And with those technologies, I decide and choose what to do. And with those technologies, I do a lot of activities when I'm traveling. Okay? So for example, I'm in Bournemouth, and I would like to find out which restaurant to go to. So, I'm just connected to tourists, and I see, oh, it's already 6 o'clock, and the tourist office is closed. So what do I do? I cannot walk there, but I'm, I'm let's say, in Bournemouth Low Gardens, and I don't really want to walk there. So it's about taking technology of where I am. I take the technology with me, I've got my mobile devices, so I access information where I am, not the other way around. Also, it's about any time. There is no closing times anymore. It's simply about technologies with the tourists. The tourists have now access to all this information in a period of time. It's about real time. So I might go online, check um, social media or like TripAdvisor, where can I find a good restaurant, or I might tweet to one tourists and say, hey guys, can you recommend me a good restaurant? Okay? So it's about opening the style of where, wherever I am and wherever, wherever, whatever time it is. Then also what is happening, and this is very important, is that this is happening in all the travel stages. So it's before, during, after travel. And this is very important that we keep that in mind, that it's not about the physical experience that is happening in the destination, but it's also about pre and post. And then it's about anyone. And we are really now connected to anyone in a network of actors. And what Kim has said, one of the key dimensions of smartness is people. People are the ones that are connected to you, and you as a tourist are in the center of it. So if we look at those dimensions and uh, combine them, we can effectively see a model like this. This looks a bit complex, it's more academic again, but this is a model that I've adapted from uh, my PhD research and has emerged. But it's quite simple at the end of the day. It simply shows that at the top, we have the tourist who is now uh, entering a dual relationship with the tourism company, and technology is the middle kind of, let's say, the glue who connects every, uh, which connects everything. So technology is bringing together all those different actors. But what we can also see is that we've got tourism companies and consumers, and those are the traditional thing that we call B2C, business to customer. But beyond that, we now have much more connected actors. And we can effectively see that we're connecting with a lot of people that are not just the company. And it's about connecting with other customers with our own social networks. And this is something that we in, uh, call C to C cooperation, customer to customer cooperation. And this is a big uh, thing that we're currently looking into, and this will we'll be seeing much more in the future. But it's effectively about going away a bit from the B to C bubble to really moving things into the C to B, C to C bubble because this is where things are happening. And then we've got another third dimension, which is A to A. This is the latest academic perspective, which says effectively we cannot say we're doing B to C or C to C, we're doing A to A, actor to actor cooperation, or I, as I call it, anyone to anyone cooperation. It's about getting connected to really anyone. It might be local to give me a reply on social media about the restaurant. It might be hotel that says, oh, have you checked that? that place we really like and recommend. So it's about anyone can now join the social media <coughs> interaction and can now co-create experiences with me through a range of technologies. What this model effectively, um, I hope, shows you is that nothing is happening anymore really in the B2C. It's about opening the spaces. It is about really bringing all the different actors together. And what companies need to realize, and this is one of the fundamental cooperation, is that the company is only one player who creates an experience with the customers. But beyond that, we really create our experiences with a lot of different actors. And the customer is the one who chooses to co-create with. Okay, so now let's have a look at a few examples um, to wrap up. 
So those are just examples from the industry, best practice in the, in the, in the world that we can currently see. So, for example, we've got Soul Media Social Waves. What they have done is the first, the world's first Twitter hotel, and they implemented hashtag in the hotel setting. It's not necessarily about the hotel tweeting and connecting with the customers or the guests, but it's allowing guests to connect with each other. It's about C to C co creation. It's about bringing them together, allowing your guests to create better experiences in your hotel environment. But they are the ones to create experience. You as a company, you as a hotel, just facilitate the environment for them. Another example is um, simply mobile applications. You as a destination, for example, you could come up with a mobile application, develop it, and you um, give tourists the, the resources or the tools to uh, work in their own context, their own location, but they are the ones who have to control it. They can co-create their experiences in their own way. Then we've also seen evidence of the sharing economy, Uber, Airbnb, hugely booming, and we will be seeing much more of that in the future. It's about effectively understanding that it's not peer-to-peer. It's not only simply businesses who are competing in the marketplace, but we can see so many customers that are now offering the same kind of services or different kind of services. So we can say there's a challenging uh, kind of idea. C to C, is it new B to C? That's a question for every one of you. Uh, or we can see co-creation as an evidence, for example, in restaurants, for example, in a mall, where customers can um, work with the, with the e-tape technology. It's about effectively customizing your experience. So give them the tools, and they will be the ones who co-create their own experiences. Or we can see, for example, in another hotel setting, that you can also co-create with customers uh, in, by empowering your employees to co-create with them. So employee to customer co-creation as well, to create high tech, high tech and high touch experiences. And then the last one is marriage. They have opened up a competition of crowd, uh, crowdsourcing in the sense that they um, ask the crowd for ideas of what they can develop in a hotel environment. It's about co-production. You not just uh, allowing customers to co-create experiences, but you asking them actually for their ideas to say, hey guys, what do you think, how should a hotel room look like? What features shall we install and what are your ideas on that? So they have realized great features in a hotel setting, visual boards in rooms, because those were suggested by customers. So it's about co-creation, but also co-production. Okay. Those are a few great examples for you to, to look at and maybe if you, uh, explore further. So let me just wrap up here and give you a couple of points to take away. The very first point, I think, if there's anything you want to take away, is that the customer is in the center. The customer is the central element now in cooperation and in smartness. And we can reach this customer with our technologies. So the customer is really the, the, the center of the ecosystem. Then the customer is now connected to a whole range of actors. And we really need to understand that as a business, we only play one part of that. But the customer chooses to engage with a whole different uh, range of actors. And what we can do, and our job is, is to facilitate those processes so that our customers can better connect with other people through technologies and smart technologies. Technology, as we've heard, is absolutely the catalyst of change. Technology really will bring those changes in the future and allows us to enhance co-creation and, and value. And in order to be at the forefront of smart tourism and also competitiveness, it is about understanding how to use smart technology to create better experiences, how to create more value, and how to allow our customers to co-create their own experiences. And what I would like to take uh, away for you is Put on uh, your co-creation glasses after today. Think about the possible ways in which now you can look through this theoretical lens of co-creation to understand where are opportunities for you to facilitate co-creation through those technologies for better experiences and better value for our customers. Thank you very much. Thank you, Okay, guys, uh, you've got the full range of um, different presentations from my colleagues, and you can see the work that we're doing in both university. I'll open the floor to questions to all of my colleagues, um, and let's have a conversation about where um, smart is going with the ritual um, arena and how we're going to take things forward, and what kind of questions are coming to yourselves based on. The things that we have heard so far. Any questions, statements, 
Are you this? Do you see marketing changing, marketing tools, marketing going to a new arena, which is going to a new stage, really? Yes, no. <laughs> ah, that's why. That's amazing. Let's say who you are, where you come from, and what you can do. I don't remember what it's called, for you, okay? But uh, I'm Dr. Yuri Park from uh, 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 University of Extra Business School. And I have a question for Cedric. Uh, can you, in the, uh, this uh, program you use, the personal assistant uh, program, when it analyzes how good or bad the restaurant is, what sort of resources does it use for that? Does it use uh, social media resources that people say about it, or some critics say about it, or how is it rated in, I don't know, uh, sort of food magazines? Where does this information come from? So, <clears throat> it always two things. It always Yelp, so social net, well, crowdsourced, reused Yelp to the devices. And then it overlays on top of that um, user picture. So if myself, I'm rating things, it will be taken into consideration to curate that environment for me. So it will be more only look at what are the best restaurant on TripAdvisor. It will look at what are the best restaurants that are also not previously liked that are matching my own text. So it's the mixture. And it's a learning machine. So it starts with those are the best restaurants, according to TripAdvisor, to those are the best restaurants for you. The first one is free, then you pay. Okay. <laughs> How much? <laughs> well, uh, but everybody is in the continuation of that. I'm just trying to understand how deep it goes. For example, if your person of social offers certain social network, and you have friends and followers and such, would that program see how if we can rate the breast or how how high they rated it? So it actually provides you an opinion of people you actually know or are connected with, or doesn't it go that far? Um, so, sorry. Um, so, there is another opinion question beyond that. That's a specific experience, but it goes beyond that, which is the integration of social signals to deliver relevancy in a social system. Right? If, I, if I zoom out. Um, there has been um, a few experiments that have been done by both Google and, and Microsoft three, four years ago to integrate social signals. Um, both companies have uh, backtracked a bit on that. The, the principle that was at that time the, the, uh, the, um, the, base of the, 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 the basis of the assumption was if, you, if your friends like something, you should, it should be more relevant for you. Um, but it raises a series of questions about what is relevance. Is relevancy uh, affinity? Is relevancy freshness? Is affinity uh, authority? Um, and with the rise of social networks, there was a bias towards actually it's probably affinity that is the most certain. And you started to see also some negative behaviors around that by people, uh, with people saying, well, actually, it brings you into a, a funnel effect where you are, not see, you are seeing less and less of the world by web and more and more of your very narrow way. Um, so from there, both actually Google and Microsoft stepped back from it. Uh, and the degradation of Google Plus, for instance, in the, uh, which is still you know, um, deeply ingrained in the, in the search algorithm to bring local, uh, personally relevant search results, but it's not as prominent as it was three years ago. Um, Google Plus was prominent three years ago? What is that solution? Well, in the, um, in the way the algorithm was working, right. not in this user thing. But I will comment on that, I'm not here to. Um, uh, so to answer your question specifically about um, the experience here of delivering relevant results in the context of uh, recommendations, 
Uh, it doesn't go that far. It learns about your behaviors. It integrates your own social graph, but it limits out your behavior, like your, uh, your personal assistant should do. You tell him or her, I don't really like that one, I didn't like that one, so next time I don't recommend you to go to that safe uh, 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 safe restaurant if you didn't really like it. So, thanks. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Any more questions and more issues? Okay, if not, uh, I'll ask uh, my colleague Antonio Davila to come along with his presentation.